Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism Podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with thinkers, researchers, activists, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities and how to reduce their environmental impact in a socially just and context-specific way. On today's episode, I will be discussing uh, on a topic that I'm not too familiar, I have to admit. It is loosely connected with consumption, companies, the pursuit of eco-efficiency, or the win-win paradigm which assures us that companies can maximize profits and at the same time protect the environment. As we will see, this win-wins and sustainable businesses is perhaps a pipe dream, but there is, and that sometimes we, we can even say that there is no such thing as a green company or product. However, there is still a lot that can be done both at a company and a household level to reduce their net environmental impacts. To discuss about this topic, we have Roland Geyer from the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Roland is a professor and prior to joining the Bren School, he held research positions at the Center for Environmental Strategy at Surrey uh, and also at the Center for Management of Environmental Resources in INSEAD in France. And he has worked with top industrial ecologists, but also with companies. And he has recently published this book, The Business of Less, The Role of Companies and Households on a Planet in Peril, which will actually be the basis of our discussion. So with all that being said, Roland, welcome to the podcast and thanks for your time. Can you perhaps briefly present yourself and your research? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Aristide, for having me. Um, it's it's really nice to connect back to uh, my roots in Europe. Um, and yeah, I think you, you've summarized it really well. Um, I'm definitely an industrial ecologist by heart. So um, I, uh, I cut my academic teeth doing material flow analyses of steel and aluminum, and then getting into life cycle assessment of all sorts of product systems. And, uh, but I also have um, sort of, uh, I, I started out as at a business school in the uh, mid nineties at, at INSEAD in Fontainebleau with Bob Ayers. And, um, yeah, and the, the mid nineties was just brimming with win-win enthusiasm. And, and of course at a business school, you know, it's um, much more important talking about who does things than, than just describing systems um, as sort of engineered uh, assemblages of processes and flows, which we are so much more used to do in industrial ecology. And it was actually um, a very brief um, publication by Tim Jackson and Roland Clift in 98 in the then very young Journal of Industrial Ecology uh, called Where's the Profit in Industrial Ecology? Uh, that um, con that uh, made me decide to do my PhD uh, with with them uh, at the University of Surrey. And it's basically what, what they were saying is that um, industrial ecology is amazing at modeling s engineered systems in terms of processes and flows and stocks, um, but doesn't really have what they call a theory of agency. So, you know, who actually, you know, what what decides, what determines the dynamics of these systems, and especially the changes, you know, like where these changes would come from, and and um, that really resonated because, you know, at the business school, it's all it's this idea that you know, it's businesses are the agents or consumers are the agents. So consumers make purchasing decisions and businesses make production decisions, and that is where change comes from. So I'm, I'm a little bit of a hybrid that um, you know, is sort of, uh, because my physics background, it, it's very natural for me to study, to, to model systems as sort of big uh, assemblages of processes and flows and stocks. But because of my period at the business school, I'm also really, you know, I, I was sort of 
introduced and then to some extent trained in thinking about agency in these agency engineered systems. So that, that book is of trying to bring all of that together and, uh, and, and assess why we, I feel made so little progress in the last, you know, since the earth summit in Rio and in, in 91. So we had 30 years of a lot of efforts uh, in, in terms of environmental sustainability, but at the same time, it seems like the natural environment is sort of going from bad to worse. And, and so I tried to get to the root of that seeming contradiction and then also find a, you know, a, a, more, a, a way forward about, you know, like if this doesn't work, what could work? So, I, and that's, that's what I tried in the second half of the book. So I'm wondering how did the f so I, I read here that you read the limits to growth uh, in the 80s or I, I did, end of 80s I, or something like that. You're revealing my age now. Yeah, yeah. I was a teenager <laughs> in in the mid 80s, and and um, yes, I, I I remember reading uh, Small is Beautiful um, from Schumacher, and I was very impressed by that. And and then um, I read. Um, uh, limits to growth exactly and uh yeah that left a a big impression on me as as a teenager even you know i was still in high school in germany but uh i'm, I'm wondering how so you became a physicist and then entered the the business world and then only you came back to the environment i'm wondering you know how this how this, because you said it yourself, you're a hybrid person, but how did you jump yeah. from one discipline to another? It's, yeah, it, it, uh, it, it sounds, you make it sound a bit random, <laughs> but I promise. No, there is, I'm sure there's there a story, is, but. Uh... There is logic to, to, I, I, I would like to call it meandering, maybe like <laughs> a, like, like a, like a creek bed through a, through a valley. Um, but yes, in um, uh, when I finished uh, gymnasium, German high school, um, I was off to university. But and and I already had a passion for environmental sustainability. It wasn't even co you know sustainability didn't mm. even exist, right? That sort of came up about with the Earth Summit in in nineteen ninety one. Um, so um, and but there you. You couldn't really study that in Germany. There, there mm -hmm. weren't really degrees in environmental management or environmental sustainability. The the only degree uh, was it, it was geoecology at the University of Bayreuth, and that somehow didn't resonate with me. So I, you know, I ended up studying physics because I thought it's just it's going to be a really great foundation for like all kinds of you know. Uh, for 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 studying the environment or, or or studying engineered systems even and also I was just really interested in physics uh, and yeah so off I went to Berlin in in the late eighties just before the wall came down and studied physics at the Technical University and then towards the end I um, I I tried to maybe have my uh, my thesis. You know, my master's thesis already environmentally themed, but again, I hit a roadblock because I think all the physics professors were worried that this thesis was not going to be difficult enough. <laughs> and um, so I just ended up um, doing a, a regular thesis in theoretical astrophysics, which I really enjoyed. Um, and almost became a climate modeler because that was in the in the early mid '90s, and uh, climate modeling became you know mm -hmm. like a like a really um, serious effort with the computational power of the uh, supercomputers and and so on. But then I uh, again decided that maybe that's not what I wanted to do, and then I ran out of money. <laughs> <laughs> and the only job I could find, I, I did actually apply for sort of environmental management jobs. And sometimes I, I got a, um, uh, an, an interview, but then they sort of looked at my, at, at my CV and said, but you're a physicist. And I said, yes, I am, but let, trust me, I can do this. And then, I know numbers, you're a yeah. <laughs> but you're a physicist. And so in Germany, you know, 
people are very big on formal qualifications and it didn't say environment or sustainability anywhere on my CV. So anyway, so that's why I did a little detour in financial risk management because they they love hiring physicists in in financial risk management. So that was super interesting, but um, just reinforced my idea that I, I wanted to, you know, do my passion as as my career, which is environmental sustainability. And so I just started going to conferences, talking to lots of people, made connections with the Wuppertal Institute in in Germany. And then they, uh, Stefan Bringetsu actually, he recommended mm-hmm. I reach out to Bob Ayers. And I did. And, and, and long story short, I think uh, Bob just took pity <laughs> and offered me a <laughs> Offered me a research research position um, in a big sort of big seven university uh, European you know framework five I think it was research mm. project and it was about reverse logistics and and that's that's how I got into this that that you know was my final career change so I really owe this to Bob thanks Bob. <laughs> Um, I will never forget that. Maybe he took pity because he's a fellow physicist. He's uh, he, he he also studied physics, um, and yeah, and and that's that's how I ended up at a business school. So I wasn't exactly planning to to go to a business school. It just Bob Ayers happened to be there, but it was really um, educational to sort of be in the business school environment and sort of understand how. How, how that group of people sort of thinks about sustainability also. Yeah, you were right in the middle of, you know, the belly of the beast somehow because you, you infiltrated a business school uh, thanks to the cover of, a, of an industrial ecologist, the same thing when you, when you did your PhD. So you, you kind of went, or these were incognito, let's say, uh, industrial ecologists within business. So I, I'm wondering, that must have been a, a very interesting duality or, or schizophrenia to to deal with the two because I, I can imagine the gospels are are very different. Uh, perhaps none of them make sense independently as well. So that must have been a quite enriching uh, duality somehow. It, it was a, a fascinating experience um, to sort of on the one hand work with Bob, you know, sort of one of the founding fathers of uh, industrial metabolism and industrial ecology and then on the other hand uh, work with business school professors and yeah and as you say sort of you know just um, working from very different paradigms right and the the one just being purely focused on these flows um, of materials and substances and their impacts on the environment and and just the the, the pure desire to to reduce environmental impact from industrial activities that you know, uh, cause these flows and then the other one just starting from oh you know like here are, how can we make businesses more profitable or how can you grow revenue or how do we come up with a whole new uh, business idea um, business proposal and and then you know them discovering the 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 idea of win win, and and basically trying to harness uh, businesses um, business what is it Im- instincts or impulses f- to reduce environmental impact, which is sort of what that win win paradigm says, right? Is uh, um, we can we can harness uh, businesses desire or need to increase revenue or to increase profits. F- to reduce environmental impact, so this this kind of what some people call do uh, what is it do do well by doing good or the other way around. So that was sort of this 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 idea, right? And sort of in 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 English, there's this uh, expression that I love, which you know you can't have your cake and eat it too, right? So this idea that either it's there or you eat it and then it's gone and and I think sort of win-win was this sort of idea. This no, we can have our cake and eat it too. We we you know we we can we can increase profits, we can increase revenues, and at the same time we can decrease environmental impact. Before we get there, um, 
So it wasn't always like that. Uh, from what I read, uh, you know, and especially in the 70s and so, there was a clear dichotomy between, you know, the environment or environmentalists and businesses and companies. The, it, it was a bit like a zero-sum game. You either had profits or were good for the environment. At, uh, at, no, uh, at no instance, you could have both. And then you had... Uh, so I, I discovered what 3M meant. Um, so what's the, the meaning of 3M, which is Minnesota Mining Manufacturing Company. That's they right. Ki they kind of found a middle ground um, and are perhaps one of the examples that, that kind of brings win-win or eco-efficiency to the front. Is, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So so for me, it was fascinating because, you know, like I... Um, um, I got my formative training in, in environmental sustainability sort of in, uh, in the 90s. And, and, and that was when, you know, the paradigm was eco-efficiency and win-win. And you did not question that paradigm. <laughs> it's just you, you just operated within it. And, and in a way, you know, I, I became sort of a little environmental historian uh, almost, um, when I wrote this book chess chapter, right, uh, called a, a, a brief history of business and the environment, when I realized that, just as you say, that was not always the case, and actually it was very recent, right? So, so this this idea that that environmentalists and industry are not sort of locked in an internal uh, eternal struggle. Right, where either the environmentalists win and the industry loses, or the other way around, um, that that is must not be like that. But actually, that we can sort of be all work. We can all work together, and 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 uh, you know, there is no contradiction in in sort of those two objectives. Um, that's I sort of traced it back to um, what is what is known as the Porter hypothesis. So Michael Porter was sort of a famous or still is famous business school professor at Harvard Business School. And in 91, he published a very brief article in Scientific American, basically saying that there is, a, he famously somewhere says the, um, the conflict between environmental production and business goals is a wrong dichotomy, he says. So it's, you know, like it doesn't have to be that way. And, and that was hugely influential. And that was, you know, in the running up to, um, to the Earth Summit, which obviously was a, a, a big, you know, really changed the, um, uh, global awareness about environmental sustainability and, and about environmental degradation had a huge impact, but it also popularized this idea that the conflict, this conflict is, is a false dichotomy. You know, at some point, uh, uh, Michael Porter even goes as far as saying that, um, that uh, pollution is Oh, what he, is is resource inefficiency? Waste, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so basically, you know, you can kind of insinuating that we should just design pollution out of the system, right? Why and 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 we could actually save money that way. And and um, another, which I found to be an instrumental player, is um, oh no, I can't think of his name. Um, the founder of the Business Council um, of. Uh, yeah sustainability now i need to think which of by the way you said that he was in jail and then went out because of eternity right so that yeah was, i mean uh, this, this is no one ever talks about this right but he um so stefan schmidt right yeah. who who turned uh, who who is the heir to the eternit empire right <laughs> which is uh the asbestos um, company uh, asbestos cement, right? So they they uh, they uh, made billions uh, uh, with selling asbestos cement, right? With the idea being that the asbestos fiber couldn't escape in the cement matrix, which of course we now know is very much not the case. Um, yeah, so it fascinating story. But he he was uh, he was charged with engaging um, the business community for the Earth Summit. Um, and so he, he started the Business Council for Sustainable Development as sort of a, uh, you know, body to advise the Earth Summit um, from the business community. And then they turned 
um, the name into the World Business Council of Sustainable Development. And they were instrumental in popularizing the win-win paradigm and then also the eco-efficiency approach because the big question was you know like okay if if you know how do we how do we have you know if win-win is like um the the engine of you know increasing uh, uh, f uh continuing with economic growth and then at the same time reducing environmental impact what's the mechanism by which we can achieve this and and that was going to be equal efficiency so we're just going to reduce the environmental impact per unit output you know per ton of steel per ton of other material per car per dollar gdp and that decoupling as it's called would allow us to continue with economic growth but at the same time bring down uh, overall environmental impact to sort of a sustainable level where whatever that might be right and wherever that might be it's and, very and whomever vague. defines it as well but yeah and and whoever d d determines that that this is it so yeah so they were really really instrumental and uh yeah you mentioned 3m you know the uh 3m was really um um a um way ahead of its time when they started and again there was one individual i think he's called Do um i don't want to um uh, don't want to mix up his name but one individual started um a program about waste reduction in the company and it was hugely successful and so they essentially um started this idea of pollution prevention so they started this uh, program 3P, 3M, <laughs> starting 3P, pollution prevention pays. And this idea is that, you know, let better, that rather than having pollution and then having to control it with costly pollution control technology, scrubbers, and, um, catalytic converters and, and, and treatment plants and whatnot, that it would be much smarter and also cheaper to just to reduce pollution at the source and that was again was hugely influential and they actually i think they started it in the mid 70s even so they were way ahead of their time um but then by the 90s you know it was sort of known enough um that it again kind of reinforced this idea that um that um pollution is just resource inefficiency that we could just really we could just design pollution out of the system uh, entirely um so yeah uh, so prior to that sort of big paradigm shift uh, right around the earth summit you know like if you look at the 70s and the 80s it was much more about us versus them right mm. so there was this sort of conflict mentality that um industry are sort of relentless and ruthless polluters and the only way um to change that was by um you know en engaging um you know holding them to account um with either um uh, environmental activism and eventually you know sort of powerful environmental public policy right so the 70s is sort of when all the environmental ngos were started um, in the early 70s, the modern environmental movement was started. And then soon we saw sort of real public environmental policy. And, and, but they was all focused on, on pollution control. And, and, but then, you know, there was this sort of really fascinating change in the narrative and in the paradigms uh, right around the Earth Summit, where, where suddenly, you know, it became from an us versus them sort of conflict to this idea of you know, we're all in this together and and there is no real conflict between profit and environmental protection or economic growth and environmental sustainability so really fascinating and it uh, yeah i had to sort of become you know i had to do a lot of research to really sort of dig out that story um and uh and and i think it's it's important to to remind ourselves right that it wasn't always win-win and eco efficiency yeah and even even worse than that there, there was this careho paradigm i think you mentioned that it was even the opposite they they said 
if you can't prove that what we're doing is wrong, then there is no proof somehow. So it was up to the regulators to, to bring up all of the, uh, the facts and all of their regulations and all of the, the, well, making sure that what they claim is right. And at the same time, companies were, were doing nothing to, to reduce until the, there was the proof. So there, there was this balance or this conflict, this real conflict actually between companies and institutions and, and activists. Yeah, ab absolutely. So, so Keho, um, yeah, he was, um, uh, the, so, uh, a, a, a public health professor, I think at the University of Cincinnati, I want in, or, or of Ohio in Cincinnati, I want to say, and, and he was sort of the main public health advisor to, um, to, uh, DuPont and um, the company they founded to make tetraethyl lead TL, right, which was the, the lead based additive that was added to gasoline to, to reduce knock, engine knocking and Im, improve uh, the, the engine performance. And um, that another is just an absolutely fascinating story. And, and, you know, I luckily I could just, there are some actually amazing books written about the, the story of lead um, and it's fascinating and and so um, General Motors um, uh, you know Thomas Midgley um, is the the chemical engineer that he didn't discover tetraethyl lead but he discovered that it was an, a powerful antinoch um, together with Charles Kettering and um, at the General Motors some research corporation or some some something like that in the early 20s and then they decided that um that was a great antinoch um and and almost immediately um there there were public health officials um uh, you know of several states in the u.s that that were worried about um uh, chronic lead pollution. So not just acute poisoning, but chronic pollution. And so uh, General Motors teamed up with DuPont and and uh, and uh, hired Kehoe, Robert Kehoe, to sort of manage this, you know, PR this crisis somehow. Yeah. yeah, there's somehow this sort of looming crisis of yeah, uh, lead being banned before it's even rolled out as as antinoch and yeah and and so uh, this is now called uh, known as the keyhole uh, paradigm or some people could show me the data and it basically what he said is that um you know you're absolutely right if it you know turns out that uh leaded gasoline leads to unacceptable um chronic lead pollution then we will stop producing uh, 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 tetraethyl lead immediately, but you know it's very you know it makes engines more efficient. It's uh, it's uh, it reduces anti knock. You know we need to weigh the pros and the cons, so we need more research. So it you know it was always about oh we need more research. There's too much uncertainty. We don't know enough. We need more research, and as a result, um, you know we. Uh, we used lead, leaded gasoline for over 60 years until it started being banned, even though in the early 20s, there was already in almost enough cause for concern to say, you know what, this is a bad idea. Um, you know, like using the, what we like to call the precautionary principle to say, you know, like this, let's, let's just not go there. So we had over 60 years and of course now lead is everywhere, right? We find lead, um, everywhere on the planet still um and um yeah absolutely fascinating story and you know you can see again the same the the keyhole paradigm you can see that work uh with uh, climate change mm. right it's the same was the same strategy basically of the uh, fossil fuel industry um just saying you know what we're really worried uh, but you know there's not enough science we don't have enough data we need to, so just always emphasizing the uncertainty and overplaying its role so 
yeah, fascinating. <laughs> Uncertainty on one side, not both, you know, of course, but <laughs> as mm. you, I think you said it's somewhere they prefer to be a hundred percent wrong than, uh, what was, uh, Roland Cliff's, uh, saying? Oh, uh, yeah, that, 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 you know, uh, some people prefer to be, uh, precisely wrong rather than, uh, <laughs> approximately right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, I, I that really stuck with me uh, when 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 we're you know I I think sometimes the the industrial ecology community kind of mm. falls into that trap where we sort of you know do LCAs and we we come to a result but rather than saying oh I think we're fairly certain that you know the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of battery electric vehicles are lower than internal combustion vehicles which you know we just say oh yeah but the battery model wasn't you know accurate enough so let's just build an even more complex lca yeah. and then you know and 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 then we just so we just you know i occasionally i i, I would i would like to say no let's just you know like i'm sure we can further reduce uncertainty and build even more complex and and and, and uh, involved models but sometimes i think it's worth just saying okay i think we have a real we have a robust finding here you know like uh, and 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 uh, let's just take that finding and show it to the policy makers and show it to the public at large and say so this is what we found and uh, let's let's you know what does it mean let's make some you know make some decisions rather than endlessly trying to refine <laughs> the, the LCA. Um, let, let's go back now to the to the 90s where you said, okay, there is this excitement about win-win. There is this excitement about uh, sustainable development. Everybody's pledging about their corporate sustainability activities. And since then, as you said, that we can have like encyclopedias full of pledges and uh, you know corporate sustainability activities yet the evidence shows that the planet or at least the pollution is is growing not exponentially but at a very rapid it's rate growing yeah um, and so we see that there is of course uh, a very large disconnect between the promises on the one hand and the effect uh, on the planet and on pollutions and all of that what went wrong there yeah, so um, I I think you know one one th what what happened is that um, the, you know the the win win paradigm that we can we can you know like we we can rely on the uh, motivation you know economic motivation to to inc increase profits or revenues um, in order to get the environmental outcomes that we we need in order to get the world onto a sustainable path i think this this paradigm is just so was so persuasive that um and this idea that the way to get there that eco efficiency will truly allow us to sort of achieve that um i think it was so persuasive and so compelling that um, um you know it, it became sort of I, I don't you know like no one no one questioned it I think mm. everyone sort of signed up to it and it just seemed um, like we can you know like wouldn't you know I think policymakers um, is my guess were really relieved that finally you know this you could take the heat out of this conflict between environmental uh, protection and economic goals which typically you know seems to be formulated in in growth goals um and that that it was reconcilable and i think it was just hugely appealing and um i think companies also um you know i always wonder to what extent companies and you know companies are just the people right that work in the companies whether whether managers and executives um, in in companies and in industry whether they they truly believed it or whether you know it was just very convenient that now everyone thought it was you know this this is this is uh, reconcilable um, probably a mix of both right is my is my guess 
uh, good faith actors, bad faith actors. Um, but it, it became this sort of powerful narrative. And, and so I think uh, you, you saw that, that um, going forward then in the 90s, early 2000s, there was a lot you know, of talk about, well, industry, you know, like we don't always need harsh environment, public environmental policy. We can work with self-commitments from industry, you know, with voluntary agreements and um, um, uh, just economic incentives maybe. And um, so it just became this, this overarching powerful narrative that, you know, this, 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 uh, uh, we we can achieve environmental sustainability that way, and I think one thing that it did, in particular, the eco efficiency um, idea, is that, um, and and I certainly, in in my own you know experience, I I I certainly um, was a big was um, was subject to that this idea that. We, we didn't, have, you know, like the focus was on how we produce and what technologies we use, what materials we use, but no one ever, you know, said about how much. So there, you know, there was this focus was very much sort of from how much to just how. And um, so, you know, and that's the idea of life cycle assessment, which I love and obviously was was a real is a real game changer so um but it's you know it's essentially it's an eco efficiency tool right because we're always assessing product systems and so the outcome of an lca is an eco efficiency indicator right environmental impact per product system and then we all get very excited if we find an alternative product system that reduces environmental impact say by 30% Right, and then what we what we sort of uh, don't pay attention to is that while the impact, say, per ton of material, goes down by X percent year over year, the world uh, increases its annual output of that material. Right, and there was um, a really um, wonderful paper published, I think, in two thousand fourteen by Jeffrey Damos. And it actually in the Journal of Industrial Ecology, um, and uh, it, it won the deservedly the the Gradle Prize uh, for best paper. And so he showed, you know, he just collected data about energy or environmental efficiency of ten industrial activities, and then just multiplied them with, you know, with total output either in the, you know, like US total output or global total output. And it was, he could show very clearly that the efficiency gains every single time, the efficiency gains were outgrown by the growth in total output. And and I think, I, I feel like this, you know, this idea of eco efficiency sort of uh, uh, um, led us to slightly take take the eye off the ball, you know, like the real goal, which is total environmental impact reduction, not just reducing impact per output. And then, you know, just, um, you know, assuming that, that that'll be good enough. So, so that for me was sort of the, um, a big kind of rediscovery where I kind of, you know, could, could take my, my LCA work, which is all about impact per product and sort of my, my earlier MFA work which is about following total flows and put those two together and suddenly see, you know, and, and the picture that emerges is very clear, right? There's that, yes, there are sort of efficiency gains pretty much everywhere, um, even though sometimes it looks like they might flatten out, right? When you sort of reach some kind of thermodynamic limits or, or something, but it's, it's just, um, uh, it, it was nowhere near enough to reduce total environmental impact because we just we just make more and more of everything and um isn't isn't it the the right time for you to to perhaps uh put forward the jeevan's uh, paradox yeah um i mean it's yeah jeevan's paradox is is uh, is is fascinating um and um shall we 
just briefly I'm go for explain it. it yeah absolutely i'm 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 sure you know uh, this is a sophisticated audience <laughs> so probably most of them know know it have any anyway but yeah so he um he was sort of a i think a cleric and scholar in in the 19th century uh, uh, britain and um 100 you know uh, bef i think it was about 100 years be before he wrote this famous uh, book um, uh, James Watt improved dramatically improved the efficiency of the steam engine right lots of people think that Watt invented the steam engine but he didn't right it was Newcomen if anyone that invented the steam engine but was terribly inefficient and James Watt uh, uh, you know if anything he was like an efficiency pioneer he, he found incredible ways to make the steam engine more efficient and uh, um, and uh, Jevons uh, said, you know, famously in his book that um, uh, one should not assume that coal consumption, right, which is the input into the steam engine, will go down because of the efficiency improvement. Actually, it will go up. Um, and he was right um, because, you know, he could show how um, suddenly the um, the demand for steam engines skyrocketed because they were suddenly so much more economic and affordable and so coal consumption in the uk actually increased rather than decreased so that's what you know, now is known as jevon paradox and then during the oil crises i think energy efficiency wasn't much of an issue until the oil crisis in the yeah. 60s um happened and suddenly you know, Europe and the United States and other countries suddenly discovered the the benefits of of uh, energy conservation and energy efficiency, and um, the United States, you know, for, uh, introduced um, an efficiency standard, right, uh, called CAFE, Corporate Average Fuel Economy, in uh, in 1970. As a you know, as a direct response to the oil crisis, and and the assumption was that um, that an, an increase in energy efficiency would just translate one to one into a decrease uh, in energy consumption because it couldn't possibly, you know, impact total consumption of that energy service. Um, and then there were a couple of uh, influential thinkers that. Um, basically rediscovered uh, Jevons um, research and then said, no, we should, you know, this is naive. We shouldn't assume that we should, we should, uh, you know, we, we should be aware that uh, an increase in efficiency might actually um, at least partially increase the use of this energy service or even on other energy services. So that modern version is now called the, you know, famously the en energy efficiency rebound effect. And uh, yeah, and I think rebound um, again is is um, is is something that I hopefully the industrial ecology community is sort of rediscovering. I feel like there is there is renewed interest in 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 sort of um, really thinking about rebound. Uh, I know that you know you can. Um, it's estimating rebound is extremely difficult, especially you know the the what they call direct rebound. So so there's lots of controversy whether yes rebound exists, but it's tiny, so we don't need to worry about it. Or yes rebound exists and it's really big, so yes we do need to worry about it. Um, so I'm I'm just glad it's you know it's back in the public debate. And then of course. Um, you know, like uh, my sort of or our little contribution to the rebound discussion was that I, you know, we because I mostly I did my PhD on reuse and recycling. Um, you know, now famously known as the circular economy. Back then, it was just called reuse and recycling. Um, and and I sudden at some point started to worry whether there could be something like a rebound effect uh, based. You know, from reuse and recycling, if if reuse and recycling is actually cheaper or uh, more efficient than 
you know, virgin production, then there could be something like a rebound that we, you know, we call this circular economy rebound. And again, it's really difficult to quantify, but the, the sort of research we did so far suggests that yes, there's, there, you know, like we're pretty certain that there's a rebound effect. How big it is, you know, it's not clear, but um, so yeah, re rebound is, is um, important piece in this in this puzzle of connecting you know eco efficient you know like eco efficiency with total environmental impact reduction and I'm, I'm 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 glad there's sort of renewed interest in in um studying and understanding rebound effects so, so you have these three pieces of information you have this eco efficiency is good it's kind of working we have this rebound effect that tells us well even if you are doing good with eco-efficiency. Perhaps we're not seeing the, the gains at the end of the day. And at the end, we have also LCA, which is kind of the life cycle assessment that kind of proposes alternatives from one product or one service to another. But oftentimes, you know, the, the gain that you have on over one environmental impact is perhaps lost in another environmental impact or, you know, along the chain and all of that. So we're kind of trapped in, in this you know, we, we, we don't have any more solutions. And you and your colleague wrote a publication saying there is no such thing as a green product. And so we're stuck, right? What's, what can we do and what <laughs> is a green product business or even service? Yes. Um, I mean, we, we, chose, <laughs> we chose that title to, to kind of be provocative for sure. So, you know, uh, Obviously, there, there are sort of alternatives to existing products that clearly have a lower environmental profile than you know, the incumbent. So, you know, and, and that's, of course, particularly true if the in incumbent is sort of polluting or inefficient, right? So I, I do truly believe that electromobility has a lower environmental impact than you know, fossil fuel based mobility, I, I do really, I mean, I think it's, you know, we have enough LCAs to show that renewable electricity has a much lower environmental profile than fossil fuel based electricity. And, you know, it's, it's pretty simple to show that plant based protein uh, has much, much lower impacts than animal based protein. So it's not that there aren't, you know, alternatives that really reduce environmental impact um, but I, we just wanted to warn against this idea that all we have to do is sort of switch out you know brown materials for green materials or brown technologies for green uh, technologies and and that's all we have to do and then everything will be great um, because I think you know there's just at least the last 30 in the last 30 years whatever we've achieved, in terms of, you know, greening our products and technologies, the gains have all been sort of eradicated by just total growth in consumption. And I think that's the discussion I really want us to have mm -hmm. is that, it, you know, like, yes, you know, solid state lighting is fantastic, but, you know, there, there are studies out there that suggest that there's a real still pent up demand, there's plenty of demand for artificial lighting, and that it could actually be possible that solid state lighting rather than reducing electricity consumption will just further light up the entire planet, which it is what historically has happened, right? So there, there are wonderful studies that show that every time artificial lighting became cheaper, um, we just increased our consumption of artificial lighting so I, I i just want us to to have that discussion that you know it's not enough to just find that green product or find that green material if it even exists but we need you know so we need to not just talk about what we consume but also how much um so it's about quantity it's not just about how and and i think that's that's a discussion that um, I, you know, I feel like, at least in my personal experience, most people shy away from. 
you know it's it's so much easier to it's it's so much easier to sell a technological solution where we can just say oh yeah and now we have solid state lighting so lighting sustainable now right and now we have electromobility so mobility is sustainable now and and i think you know like that will be a bad bad fallacy if we if we fall for that well you also call it mobility not cars which already puts it into frame we're thinking about I, what is the best mobility rather than putting yes. in front you know the car and i think that's I, in, of course in, part of it i'm i absolutely and this is probably you you know you you know you've probably thought a lot hard about that in terms of you know like urban metabolism but yeah it's you know like as you know i'm here in California, which is probably one of the most car centric <laughs> places on the planet. So yeah, um, you know, like in sustainable transportation in California means green cars, basically. Um, and, and that's why I always say mobility, because I don't want to, I want to remind myself to not fall into that yeah. trap, right? That simply switching out, um, diesel and gasoline cars with battery electric vehicles, I think is we're going to find very soon because I think they're going to be successful. Um, but we, then we're going to find out and someone is going to write a paper about it that it's nowhere near enough to make transportation sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. So you have mentioned a number of companies and you have, I think, uh, worked with or advised a number of companies. I'm wondering, is there you know, there, there is the, of course, this extremely famous uh, ads from Patagonia saying, right. "Don't buy this jacket." And I think we we'll, we still want to. I mean, we we'll, we still need to clothe ourselves, feed ourselves, move ourselves, heat ourselves, and all of that, right? So companies need to be here, or else we we think everything is state owned, and so we we move into a different, you know, completely different system. But let's say. We maintain companies. What is it? Uh, what is a good company, or what is, you know, uh, or what are some good examples that you can uh, share with us? That, that and you can say this company m makes you know a net positive impact on the planet. Oh, you got me there. Um, <laughs> the, well, is there I one? Think, yeah, I think that is the million-dollar question. Yeah, um, and I'm, I, I'm, I, I think the most honest thing right now is to to say I don't have a clear answer. Um, I think you're right that you know, like I feel as a response to kind of my thinking and what 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 I've written is that um, you know I guess sometimes I get the response that. You know, we 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 should just stop talking to companies altogether, right? This so you know, like when when I when I wrote uh, when I submitted my book to the publisher, you know, it was in in like uh, early this year, and I had this moment where I handed it over and thought, okay, this is the end of my career because <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 saying co corporate sustainability doesn't work, right? And, you know, I, I was still enough connected with the corporate sustainability sort of bubble work yeah. and bubble. Yeah, that I thought like, oh, you know, the backlash is going to be fierce. Um, and within weeks, I found articles published that said the exact same thing by corporate sustainability professionals um, and also by business school professors. You know, some really instrumental in the whole win-win research, uh, um, and so I suddenly thought, like, oh, this is you know, like this. I'm not clearly not the only one, and and maybe this isn't going to the end of my of my career uh, because there there seems to be sort of an, an awakening of this, and and some now sort of go as far as saying just just stop talking to businesses and all we need is just fierce environmental public policy and and enforcement of those policies because it's the only way forward uh, but then you know policy uh, depends on at least in democracies on what the voters 
sort of want or, or, or apparently want. And so then we need the green consumer. And, you know, there are studies uh, that, uh, that surveys I read about Germany where, you know, everyone in Germany is really worried about climate change. And then when you ask them, are you going to change your lifestyle? And they say no, <laughs> so so that's not going to work. So 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 right now the question is why who who is the agent going to be of you know like who is going to drive these 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 changes? And I think you know and and I'm not ready to just abandon you know to 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 uh, as you say to sort of just say businesses just need fierce policy. I think you know there's a way I, I can't you know business is, is not business is not going away right it's it's the way we make things it's the way we move things um, it's most people are employed by businesses or own businesses so but I think businesses currently are also sort of trapped in this idea that you know either we grow or we perish or you know or we need to get more profitable because what's the alternative and so I would I, I just love I, I want I want to explore this idea that businesses could be driven by other you know that the 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 the, the driving or motivating principle of businesses could be something else other than relentless pursuit of econo of growth and and profits and I feel that there are businesses out there that are really thinking about that and that are starting to grasp the you know the the dichotomy between eco-efficiency and total growth um but i i also feel that um there's they don't i don't know anyone that seems to have a, a clear clear answer about how how to move forward i mean one company that i am going to to name drop now is is patagonia <laughs> The apparel company, which you know, is basically my neighbor, because they, uh, I'm I'm in Santa Barbara. Their headquarters are in Ventura, which is 30 miles south. And I do feel that uh, Patagonia is really trying to 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 do the right thing. You know, it, I think it helps that they are, uh, um, you know, they um, they they are uh, owned basically by a family rather than large shareholders so it makes it easier for them to sort of change direction and make risky decisions um but but even patagonia is struggling to sort of reconcile this idea of you know reducing the environmental impact per fleas and growing five to ten percent year over year so i know they're having these discussions right now i know they're exploring with recycling and reuse models and and repair models which i think really i think could could you know provide some of the answers right um to really um shift away from you know i think essentially what companies need need to do is shift you know they need to decouple their success however it's defined from selling stuff so they need to sort of shift they need to start selling non-stuff <laughs> what you know like whatever that is so yeah. I, I think one idea could be labor right that rather than selling things they they could increasingly sell time you know like skill and time of of employees um like you know that's essentially i feel like what repair is doing right so you're not you're not selling a new product but you're basically um selling the time and the skill of the employees to bring your product back to life and and uh, so i'm that's that's kind of i'm thinking about that a lot you know the, like the the role of of let's call it labor right the the the, the role of labor in sustainability um but yeah i feel you know, maybe there's hope in sort of with startups. I feel like, hmm. at, at least, I feel that in 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 the US, there's sort of a, I, I think one set of sort of the new business and startup community that are really value driven. So they basically do this because they, you know, they're not trying to take over the world with their product, but they're just 
you know they love what they're doing and and they want to sort of make uh, really good products um, without without ruining the, the the environment I think they're it's, it's going to be interesting to see how they are able to operate in the current sort of right economic environment but maybe we do need to change like the, the you know the, the economic environment yeah so I think short answer is I'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> but you do have so let's to 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 wrap this up you do have some strategies for companies and some other for households um i think yes. because also there is this um element of we don't know how to move forward we know we're screwed but you know it's nice also to have a roadmap ahead for companies you say you should already you should improve your net environmental performance and you should do right. so by doing the, the strategies that you mentioned again, or this could be perhaps a circular economy and mm -hmm. difference, substitution, and then less, uh, well, reducing the total amount. Right. So yeah. that, that is, if you have a company that comes to you and tells you, how do I improve my net environmental performance? These are, let's say, the three uh, pillars that you present. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, you know, it's it's... It's just based on, I, th I think, you know, agreed upon ways to look at pollution prevention, right? How, how can we prevent pollution? So, you know, like um, there are essentially those three ways we can do, do this, right? We can uh, reuse and recycle things. So that would be now the circular economy. I just call it again as sort of a shortcut. Mm -hmm. Or we can really do material and product or technology substitution. So just use something less impactful, you know, like plant-based protein, um, electrify technologies, um, renewable um, elect energy. Um, or, you know, I would say, and a the third, I call that different for short. And then the third strategy is truly is, is less. Um, which I think is sort of the most straightforward one, but also the most challenging because it it you know it's difficult to fit that into our current sort of win you know still kind of prevailing sort of growth and and win win paradigm um, and um, yeah and and this idea of net green is just that you know it's not enough to just increase the eco efficiency of of your business but you know you, you basically need to take the eco efficiency indicator and multiply it with your total sales or total output and then you can see you know whether you actually have overall reduced the environmental impact um you know and obviously if you you know like one way could be if you just really take away market share from you know a more impactful company so it's not that no company is allowed to grow, you know, certain companies we want to grow, right? Like electromobility providers, right? We want them to grow um, generators of, elect uh, of renewable electricity. Well, we want them to grow, but we need them to grow um, in cannibalize, of, yeah, to, right. Exactly, yeah, that, yeah, that's exactly the right word. We, we need them to grow at the expense of the, you know more impactful um uh businesses and and ways to to produce things and and not not in addition to and i think that's it in a way it's almost trivial once you think about it but i think not always we don't always think about that so you know right we were you know like um i here in the us there's this big discussion about well big discussion you know People talk about how much more how the growth of, um, say, photovoltaic, um, uh, 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 solar power, and wind power. Um, but of course, what you need to do is you need to look at the growth and then see whether it actually you know, reduced our reliance on fossil fuels because it's entirely possible to just have that on top of all the fossil yeah. fuels. And I know, you know, I think Europe is sort of struggling with this 
the, the same. Germany wants to have it both ways, right? They want wind power and solar power, but they also want their coal powered uh, electricity. And that obviously that that's not net green, right? And so so that's this concept. Um, in, in a way, I, I actually think it's it's basically sort of a simplified version of consequential life cycle assessment if you're familiar with mm -hmm. that right it's sort of rather than doing the attributional kind of environmental accounting type lca you could sort of just say well what are the consequences of changing a product design or introducing a, a, a whole new product right and and one consequence could be that it increase, you know, like in, increases total consumption, and then the CLCA would actually warn you and say, "Well, you know, be, be careful." You, um, so that's kind of why why I'm going back to this idea. The most powerful thing would be less, right? So maybe companies just need to radically rethink their business models and say, you know, rather than saying i'm a steel producer i you know my i'm i'm just selling steel to my customers right if and success means i'm selling more steel um so maybe the idea is how can i help my customers get the most out of you know the smallest amount of steel the function that, that i of, can yeah. sell them yeah and you know again it's not i don't you know this these ideas sort of you know selling the service rather than the actual product has been around for, for a long, long time. Um, so it's it's not that this is a brand new idea, but I think the urgency is brand new. I think we really need to get serious about you know, rethinking, radically rethinking business models. And, and I think companies like Patagonia are actually in the process of doing that. And, and I see some exciting new startups that are doing that. Um, you know, car sharing, for example, right? Um, there, there's this beautiful st uh, survey coming out of the University of Berkeley that showed that car sharing is green because it makes people drive less. That's that's like the main reason why car sharing, um, you know, sort of reduces environmental impact. Not so much that a shared car is less impactful than an owned car, but, you know, households overall just drive less because of so so for me car sharing is a, is a business that enables people to get all their mobility and access needs met with less driving and, and so what I about that's how sorry what about households then is it the same as companies do you also say again different <laughs> less or I, I think so. Yeah, it's it's the same idea. Yeah. So the I think the the pollution prevention principles are universal. I I do think you know it's always about yeah uh, again or different or less and um, and it so it applies to households right and this the the net green idea you know so not so much so it also applies so in a way for households just. Uh, like companies, you know, the question is not so much what is the green thing that I just bought, but what is the brown thing that I no longer have, you know, like, so it's not about buying an electric vehicle, if that's the approach, but, you know, d does that mean that, you know, you got rid of your old car and, you know, and, and are you really, you know, or, you know, what is, what is your, the impact overall of, of your, of your, you know, transportation behavior, and is it really coming down, um, right? So if, if you put a, a beautiful solar panel array on your rooftop, um, you know, that alone it is not green because, you know, it could be that, you know, now it means like, I don't have to worry about electricity consumption, right? I don't need to ever switch lights off again in my household because I have, I have, I have solar on my roof, right? The idea is that it's only green if you, if you use less grid electricity. So it's, it's, it's the same idea. Um, and again, so I think the, the, um, a, a more holistic approach helps households to make really effective decisions. So it's less about, you know, buying product A versus product B, but, you know, like, what is the total footprint of my spending, 
right, of household spending. And I think that help, would help households, you know, including my own, um, to sort of make sure that you, you don't suffer from rebound effects, right? Where you sort of suddenly get really efficient and then just spend the money you save on, you know, yeah, in, it's, to, to fly to an exotic destination, right? It seems so often that we're stuck in this, uh, uh, you know, paralysis by analysis, but uh, yeah. Um, well, there is two things I, I generally ask at the end of, of the podcast. W what is next now that you have your manifesto out? What are you planning to do uh, in, well, 2021 is already over, but 2022, do you have uh, some plans uh a project or something that you're writing uh, um, for 2022. I'm. Oh, thanks for asking that. I'm. I'm really. Um, yeah. I'm. I'm so. I got the book out, and and that feels great. And yes, I. I am a little bit in this phase of now. What you know? What's next? I. I do know that. I. I would really love to explore this idea of the role of labor uh, to advance environmental sustainability. I think it's sort of something that uh, we as industrial ecologists have maybe a little neglected a little bit. And I think it's it's kind of ironic because I think as the standard assumption is, right, that all the impact, which I think is correct, that all the impact comes from the material and energy inputs into our product systems and and the you know the processes in there and we basically don't account for the labor component basically assuming that it has no impact which i think is is true um but i think by kind of just ignoring labor we're sort of i, I think we've um ignored what i see as potentially a key piece in in getting out of this um, paralysis, as you're saying. I think labor could, could hold a key piece to advancing environmental sustainability. So I'd, I'd love to uh, uh, design some, some research around this and, and really understand that better. So if anyone in your audience wants to, wins to embark on that journey with me, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear from them. And um, the last thing uh, you, so I'm generally asking what type of uh, books or articles or movies or videos you would like to to recommend to to go a bit deeper on this topic or or any other topic in, in that you feel interesting to to explore. You mentioned some of the the articles of uh, Roland and Tim, uh, also some other ones. Any anything that stands out? Oh, I have a long long list of things I need to read. <laughs> and um, I mean, uh, Tim Jackson has written a new book, which is on my reading list. Um, so, uh, you know, he's, you know, like, uh, um, he's, he's, he's become very outspoken, right, in his um, uh, sentiment that, that uh, economic growth is absolutely not reconcilable with uh, environmental sustainability. So uh, he might be even more outspoken now in his new book. Um, so I look, I, I look forward to, to reading that. That's on my list. Um, what else is on my list? Um, oh gosh, I can't, I can't think. And uh, that's, that's the one I, I can think of right now, but I'm sure, I'm sure there are many, many more. Um, it, it does seem like, um, you know, the, there is this increasing um, uh, sentiment that something's not right about corporate sustainability, the way we currently do it. And I know there are, there are other books um, that have been written recently or that are probably are being written right now. So I'm, I, I really want to um, get into that literature and sort of see what, what other scholars or other practitioners or, or anyone is sort of thinking about this. So I'll, I'll definitely look for that. Quite frankly, I was, uh, I have not been reading enough this year. So <laughs> it's not, it's never enough. <laughs> never, never enough time. <laughs> 
Well, thanks so much, Roland, for all of the interesting discussions. I learned a lot thanks to you and, and your book. Um, well, thanks so much for the discussion. <laughs> and thanks, everyone, to listening until the end. Please share it around if uh, you have some colleagues working in companies that you know, are asking themselves these questions and they don't know how to, to move in, these, uh, in this sphere. And also, if you're an industrial ecologist and you want to come a bit closer to the, to the world of companies and to the, this question of agency, I think you'll enjoy this very much. So thanks everyone, and we'll see you in two weeks with a new episode. Cheers.